a big holiday show in the Santa Clauses. Tim Allen returns for that. And uh, as well, Sylvester Stallone making his series TV debut in a hard-hitting show called Tulsa King. Let's talk TV. Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews. Welcome to TV News and Reviews for the week. We've got six shows to talk about, including Sly Stallone in Tulsa King. We've got Tim Allen returning uh, as Santa Claus in Disney Plus's The Santa Claus's uh, Emily Blunt in her, I think, TV debut as well in, in terms of a whole series uh, called The English. Uh, we have something on Peacock called The Calling, and then a couple of kids shows as well uh, over on Nickelodeon uh, that are based on existing properties. The Really Loud House and Monster High gets uh, the, the TV treatment. So uh, before we get into that, of course, we must talk the news. Um, and I want to remind you, we do the, the news and reviews uh, every single week here. And, um, you know, I'm always a little bit behind the uh, so, but, but that's okay. Um, you know, it gives people a chance to catch, uh, some of these shows with more episodes. Um, for example, next week we'll talk, we'll tackle Wednesday. Um, and that's, uh, something in our news as well that we will talk about in terms of ratings because uh, Wednesday is a huge hit. So we'll talk about that next week. But, uh, in terms of this week's news for renewals and cancellations, well, we're going to start with a renewal of a show that we're going to talk about this week, which is Tulsa King. That has been renewed for season two already on Paramount+. Plus. Um, it had a linear premiere as well on Paramount Network that uh, was the biggest uh, premiere for a new show of this entire year, and that includes House of the Dragon um, on HBO. So obviously a lot of anticipation for this show, um, and the premiere in terms of uh, numbers on Paramount+. Plus. The premiere day, they had more sign-ups in one day than in any other day in the streamer's history. So, obviously, a lot of people wanted to check out that show. We'll see what I thought about it coming up in a little bit. Also renewed Tell Me Lies for Season 2 on Hulu. I gave that a C+, so not I'm not super excited about that, but whatever. Um, and then Surface for season two on Apple Plus, and I gave that one a C. One of the one of the rare sort of uh, stumbles for Apple TV Plus. Usually they do so well, but uh, I did, didn't really care for that. So a cu couple of eh shows <laughs> that got renewed. Um, and in terms of uh, gain gaining more episodes, not necessarily a renewal, but a full season pickup for. NBC's Lopez versus Lopez. Now, I did not care for this show, but I love that NBC uh, continues to try and back multi-camera comedies. Um, so we'll see how long this one lasts, but uh, it's it scored a back nine, which uh, in industry lingo means, you know, nine more added onto the original 13, uh, giving it a full 22 episode season which is kind of wild. And then uh, next week, George Lopez and his daughter Mayan, uh, who are the two stars of the show, will also be announcing the Golden Globe nominations, which makes sense because that's usually on NBC. So I guess uh, really kind of hit, hit that point home with them. Um, and in terms of series endings, Monarch is done at Fox. It had, uh, I believe, 11 episodes for that first season. Uh, my buddy Tim and I did the uh, all the new broadcast shows for the fall and uh, we both agreed that was uh, the worst of them. I think I gave it maybe a D plus, and uh, he gave it I think slightly higher, but he may have he, he may have been talked down I think uh, to a D plus or something. But um, yeah, it wasn't very good. Um, and, and I can appreciate that they are continuing to try these sort of soapy dramas. Um, but I don't know, Fox doesn't usually work too well with them. You know, they had that Filthy Rich with Kim Cattrall. Uh, about a year and a half ago that I actually kind of really liked um, in terms of, you know, a soapy drama. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like maybe ABC does better with those. You know, they had Scandal, you know, the Shonda Rhimes kind of shows, um, you know, Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, Monarch done at Fox. I don't know if they're going to try and shop it somewhere else or not, but uh, for now that is that is done. In announced shows, Scarlett Johansson is going to star in and executive produce a film called Just Cause, which is uh, going to be a limited series on Amazon based on uh, this 1992 novel. Uh, and it is ScarJo's first lead role in a TV series. Um, and if, if the name sounds familiar to you, it is because ScarJo uh, actually is coming full circle with this because the novel was previously adapted for a movie in the mid-90s starring Sean Connery and Johansson played 
Connery's daughter. So, uh, you know, obviously she's still attached, uh, you know, or attracted to this material. So we love that. Uh, in some odds and ends, and uh, not really much in, in news this week. So this will be the last sort of category we talk about. Um, more news about the Children and Family Emmy Awards, which is coming up in uh, just a day or two. Um, LeVar Burton will be getting the inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award presented by an old friend of his, Lawrence Fishburne. Um, and the two shows will be hosted by Jojo Siwa, who will do the Creative Arts Emmys on the 10th, and Jack McBrayer, who is going to handle sort of the big show on the 11th. And he is a nominee as well for his uh, show, Hello, Jack, The Kindness Show, which is over on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, all right, so let's uh, talk about Wednesday for a second. Uh, like I said, we're going to review that next week, but um, the show captured the biggest English language week in history history for Netflix, uh, besting Stranger Things by just a little bit, 341.2 million hours for Wednesday versus 335 million hours. So it, you know, seems like kind of a small number, but 6 million hours is, is, you know, really nothing to sneeze at for the difference. But Squid Game uh, still holds the uh, overall record um, with 571 million hours in one week. And that actually had two other weeks with more than 400. So all three of those Squid Game weeks beats Wednesday or Stranger Things. But in terms of English language, Wednesday uh, holds that. And um, I, I think part of that was the Thanksgiving weekend. A lot of people were home with their families. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I... I don't think it's too, like, TVMA. I think it is more of in the vein of, like, a Stranger Things where it's like, yeah, maybe it's a little dark, but they're not, you know, murdering people in cold blood with, you know, hatchets and, you know, a lot of swearing. Like, I, I think it's a fairly, um, you know, family-friendly show for, like, older older kids kind of thing. Um, so I think that's part of it. But also, the thing to keep in mind is most Netflix shows start on Friday. This one started, appropriately enough, on Wednesday. So it had actually two extra days in its premiere week um, to, to capture that audience. So I think that probably helped as well. But still, I think it's still very surprising. You know, Stranger Things obviously had a ton of momentum and it had been a couple of years since we had a Stranger Things season. So the momentum was just building and building. So um, for, for whatever that's worth, though, uh, people are talking about this. And I've heard mostly positive things, but I've had a couple of friends tell me they didn't like it. So uh, I'm intrigued to see what I think. Uh, when I watch that next week. And in terms of uh, other sort of ratings news, uh, CBS is right behind Netflix in total time watched. There was a new survey done um, and Netflix is number one overall with 200, and listen to these numbers, 221.47 billion minutes. Um, and I don't know if that is average per week. Like I, I don't actually know what, you know, whether that's, for the season, it can't be for the season. That's too few, I feel like. But but anyway, CBS in whatever that same time period is, uh, two one two hundred and fifteen point six four billion minutes. So again, um, you know, six is not a huge number, but when it's six billion, that is a big number. Um, but listen to how far ahead CBS is. So two hundred fifty one billion minutes. The other broadcast networks do all have a hundred each, but NBC is the next in line with only about one hundred and fifty billion. So CBS beats it by a large margin. They have seven of the top 10 non-sports programs. Um, the closest streamer to Netflix is a far cry. So Netflix has 221 billion minutes. Disney Plus is second, and they only have 21 billion. So uh, that's 200 billion minutes more on Netflix Watch. So obviously, you know, Netflix is still king of the game. I know a lot of people are you know, whatever, the price hikes and the, the content is as good. Well, you're all still watching it. So um, other than that, the uh, the numbers two through five uh, streamers, which is like Disney Plus, um, Hulu, Amazon, and HBO, I think is number five, um, barely add up together to Fox's total of 119 billion. So uh, Netflix still, still, king of the uh, the walk there uh, all right and then finally abc news has benched temporarily uh the the good morning america three co-anchors tj holmes and amy robach uh because they are now dating this was a big scandal sort of in the last week or so uh network president kim goodwin is figuring out what to do with them what the next steps are going to be they're not on the main good morning america show um that's still like what michael strahan and 
is Robin Roberts still on that? I think she is. Um, this is sort of their version of like the the Today Extra Hour with Hoda Kotb. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's kind of wild. Um, but yeah, they had started a relationship. They both, I guess, were divorced. So I don't think they were like cheating on their spouses. But um, <laughs> but yeah, tough tough situation for them. And uh, you know, we'll see where they end up. I honestly wasn't familiar with these people. Um, but but figure you know we can talk about it anyway. All right, so let's move on here to the review portion, and we're gonna start with. Tulsa King. I sort of debated with Tulsa King or the Santa Clauses, but I think we're going to talk about enough kind of uh, more kid-friendly shows uh, throughout this episode. So let's start with the heavy hitter of Tulsa King. Like I said, biggest premiere numbers for any show of the entire season. Um, and this is about uh, Sylvester Stallone's character, Dwight the General Manfredi. Um, he is a uh, New York Mafia uh, boss who just completed 25 years in prison. And so uh, he gets released and his boss sends him immediately to Tulsa to establish a criminal operation there. So he doesn't know anybody in the area. So he sort of, uh, for you know, lack of a better word, I guess, confiscates uh, or takes over a dispensary. He, having been in prison for 25 years, didn't really understand even what a dispensary was or whatever. But uh, he sort of figured that out pretty quickly. And uh, the sort of uh, manager of that dispensary is played by the great Martin Starr from uh, Freaks and Geeks and the recent Spider-Man movies. Um, and this is uh, Stallone's first role, uh, regular role anyway, in a scripted television series. I believe he's probably hosted SNL before, um, but maybe not. You never know. Uh, you know, it's always sort of odd who hasn't hosted, you know, like Carol Burnett's never hosted. Um, but anyway, uh, in terms of a, a regular series role, uh, and he's obviously loving it enough. You know, they're going to do a season two of this. Um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this show um, because it's very watchable, uh, but I'm not sure if it's good. Um, it's 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 very odd for me to, to try and suss this one out. So on the one hand, um, Stallone is fine. He's doing a Stallone thing. You know, the gravelly voice. He's kicking everybody's butt. Um, you know, he, he's doing, he's doing all his bits. Um, I'm not sure that his character is very likable because he, and I, I get it, mob, mob bosses and stuff, you know, aren't supposed to be necessarily, you know, likable, but, um, you can have sort of, certainly a more layered one, like a Tony Soprano, um, you know, or, or some of the, the folks in The Godfather, or you could be a little more one note about it, which is, I think, kind of what they're going for here. Now, as the episodes progress, you know, the good news about a show is you get, obviously, many, many hours to figure a character out. And so maybe, uh, you know, the, the character will sort of develop over time. But um, I don't know. He seems like kind of a jerk, you know, like a lot of these mafioso bosses have sort of not necessarily a, a cuddly side uh, per se, but um, more depth at least, you know, and, and of course with the Sopranos, it helped with Tony being in therapy and we saw some of those sessions and whatever. Um, but so far he's just sort of, uh, you know, being, being the man and, and whatever. Um, and so I have mixed feelings about that. But the other thing is the humor in this show, they're going for some sort of like, almost like a comedy action show or comedy drama like there's there's definitely moments of like okay this is where they want you to laugh you know it's not like they're you know mugging for the camera you know whatever and posing but um but it's just it's it's it throws me off that they're they're injecting so much humor into this show um <laughs> especially because the character is such a jerk um, so I, I, but, but it's incredibly watchable. Like I, I, I can see why it uh, has struck a nerve with people. I can see why it got renewed already for season two, uh, even though we're, we're, you know, still in the midst of season one, um, because it's, you know, a lot of fun to watch. Um, Sylvester Stallone always is uh, kind of a commanding presence on the screen, whether it's 40 years ago in the, in the Rambo movies and the Rocky movies, or, you know, the more, the more recent stuff like the Creed movies, for example, um, but, uh, I think this is a good role for him because it sort of fits his persona without going too far, you know, outside the box, but, uh, you know, so in that sense, it's, it's kind of what people want to see, what people expect maybe from him, but since it's in a TV setting, I think we will hopefully get to explore the character a little more in depth, uh, as, as the episodes go on. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, certainly. So my grade is a little more middling um, than, than I sort of expected. I kind of expected to like this a, a bit more than I do. Um, but I believe Tulsa came with a B minus. I'll sort of put it right above that line. All right, so up next, let's talk about the Santa Clauses. This is on Disney Plus, and of course, uh, this is in line with the whole film series with Tim Allen. You had the Santa Claus, and then what was it the uh, the the wife? What was it called? The what? The the Mrs. Claus. I never saw that one. That's the only one I haven't seen. And then uh, Santa Claus Three: The Escape Clause. I have seen because I love Martin Short. That was actually the first one I saw. Um, but, uh, but either way, a lot of the people returning, uh, from their original roles, Tim Allen, of course, playing Scott Calvin slash Santa Claus. You've got Elizabeth Mitchell playing Carol slash Mrs. Claus. And then, uh, some of the other people as well, um, including, uh, his, his son who we haven't really seen in a long time. I feel like, uh, Eric Lloyd, uh, portraying him as he did back in the day. And he hasn't really done much lately. So sort of, uh, you know, coming out of retirement, perhaps, for this role. Um, it's not a major role. He's more of a uh, recurring, or maybe he's just in one episode. But uh, you also have Casey Wilson from Happy Endings playing uh, the, the full-grown Sarah. Um, and, you know, a couple of the other people re reprising their roles. But uh, Cal Penn is in this, as well as uh, the potential successor to Scott Calvin. Um, so my history with this movie is I've seen the first one a couple of times. I really like it. Uh, the third one is is okay, but Martin Short kind of does it for me, um, you know. So that puts it a little bit over. I think what people mostly think of the third movie, um, the second one, like I said, haven't seen. Um, but why they chose to make this a mini series instead of a new movie, I I don't know. I, I I'm still sort of trying to figure out what the Disney Plus um, you know model is, other than Marvel and Star Wars. Um, you know, because they're putting a lot of movies on there that I think would have gone to theaters years ago. Um, but this one just seems like more of a movie to me. And I think a lot of people thought it was a movie because, you know, Disney Plus has a lot of movies, including Hocus Pocus 2, you know, another sort of, you know, long in the works sequel, um, you know, same with Disenchanted, long in the works sequel. So, you know, the last Santa Claus movie was in 2005, I believe. So here we go, you know, 17 years later. We're going to have a, a mini series about it. Um, I think it should have been a movie because one of my biggest issues with it is I'm two episodes in and barely nothing has happened. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and these are shorter episodes. I think they're like 22 minutes or whatever, but that's the same as a network comedy. A lot of things happen, you know, in those. Um, I, I, I think that this is, and, you know, everybody's fine, you know, although Tim Allen doing the ho, ho, ho as Tim from uh, Tool Time from Home Improvement. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. You know, like, that's really irritating. He probably did do that in the movies. But at the same time, that was sort of the, you know, the original movie was like mid-90s, peak Home Improvement kind of, you know. So it makes sense. To, to be still doing that 17 years after the last movie is like so sort of groan-worthy and, and eye-rolling. Um, so that's irritating. But, I mean, other than that, he's, you know, he's fine in, in the role. But everybody just seems to be sort of going through the motions here. They're they're really attempting to uh, to give Carol, Mrs. Claus, um, some kind of you know depth. She like wants more. What's my greater purpose? That sort of didn't really do much for me either. Um, you know, again, the, this is something that could be explored in a movie. And what's funny is when you add up, because I think there's only five or six episodes of this. When you add up the runtime, it really is about the same as a movie because they're 22 episodes, uh, 22 minute episodes. So I, I just, I am, I'm curious as to why, I guess maybe they can get people to talk about it more if they roll them out once a week. Um, I, I really don't know the logic. It should have been a movie. It's not, uh, I didn't find it very enjoyable though. Um, you know, at the end of the second episode, we finally find out that, uh, Santa Claus wants to retire, but, you know, that's in all the commercials. So, like, I already I already knew that. So, that, that's, like, the big bombshell at the end of episode two. And it's, like, all right, we all knew this, you know, going into the show. So, like, it's just, it's way too slow moving. I I just, I don't care about any of this. Um, so, the Santa Claus is, gets a D plus for me. All right, The English is next. This is on Amazon Prime, and uh, it stars Emily Blunt, the great... Emily Blunt, one of my favorite actresses, and I would say uh, 
probably the most versatile actress in Hollywood, uh, you know, if you're not going to count, you know, old, older people like Meryl Streep or whatever, but in terms of like a, a hip current actress, she has done literally everything. She's done, you know, horror in a quiet place. She did, she's done a bunch of different action movies, including, you know, Edge of Tomorrow. She did Mary Poppins Return. So, you know, a musical there. She was in Into the Woods as well, musical. Um, you know, she's done some comedy stuff, Devil Wears Prada. So, I mean, she really, and she's done some, some heavy drama as well. So here, this is a, sort of a, a dramatic Western. So we're sort of in that mode. And she is an English woman named Lady Cornelia Locke. Uh, and she comes to the West in 1890 looking uh, for some revenge on the man she sees responsible for the death of her son. Um, and in that, she meets uh, Sergeant Eli Whip, played by uh, Chasky Spencer, I want to say, um, who is an ex-Cavalry scout and uh, a member of the Pawnee Nation. And so he is uh, on his way to Nebraska to claim land that he is owed uh, for his service in the Army. And so uh, the two of them sort of uh, and end up traveling together and, and sort of uh, doing that. Um, this is shot beautifully. You know, the, the cinematography is great. So we'll start there. The, the landscape, great. Um, and the acting, my God, every scene, Emily Blunt reminds us why she is really at the top of the acting game. I mean, I, I, I know she um, has not won an Oscar yet. I don't even know, has she been nominated? She should have been for several things, but I'm not sure if she has been, to be completely honest. Um, she should have been nominated for Mary Poppins, to, to be completely frank about it. But um, in any event, whether she has been or not, she is, you know, one of our top actresses, and she proves it again in every scene that she's in with this. And she has a great chemistry. I'm not familiar with this uh, Chasky Spencer or whatever, but he was uh, apparently in Twilight, I only watched the first Twilight, and it was many years ago, and I hated it, so uh, I don't really remember that, but but he was in it, um, and, and I guess several movies in the series, maybe all of them. Um, their chemistry together is, is really good, really solid, um, and I, I think even though we're talking about, you know, 1890 stuff, some of the themes are present today. They, they've sort of, you know, baked in some, some present day, uh, metaphors and stuff and, uh, maybe more than metaphors, maybe on the nose things about, uh, you know, stealing land from native Americans and stuff like that. Um, you know, that has sort of come back into light lately that, yeah, we're actually horrible people. We, you know, genocided a bunch of native Americans. So, um, so, so that is, is present here. Um, my big problem with this show is though, other than sort of the, the basic elements of what the, the two kind of want, I'm a little lost as to what's happening. <laughs> two episodes in, and I'm like, I, I can't quite connect the dots to what's even happening in this show, but I like watching it. I like the acting. I love looking at it. It's beautiful. Um, so, you know, I, it has to get a positive grade for me based on those elements, but it's a little confusing. I, I, you know, I'm not positive of everything we're seeing, um, you know, and, and what it means. But uh, there's some other people in here you may know: Rafe Spall, Stephen Ree, uh, Toby Jones, names that maybe you don't know, but faces. I think you've probably seen it in many other things. Um, so I leave the English with a B. Uh, I think in another actor's hands, uh, maybe a little less, but um, you know, Emily Blunt is just always commanding that screen. So, uh, all right, we'll go over to Peacock next with The Calling, uh, and this is a drama uh, that I think is not a Peacock original. I think it's another one of those where it's, like, sort of imported, but they're throwing it up there so uh, you can watch it. But uh, I didn't recognize a ton of people in this except um, Noel Fisher from Shameless uh, has a supporting role, and then Karen Robinson, who played in uh, Schitt's Creek. She was, what was her name? Uh, Ron Ronnie. Um, she is in this as uh, the police captain. But this is a drama that uh, is all about this detective named Avraham Avraham, um, who is played by Jeff Wilbush, who I'm unfamiliar with. But uh, he basically, you know, has uh, his, his own set of uh, spiritual rules that he likes to follow. Um, but he is, uh, you know, sort of questioning that list of rules um, when a routine investigation goes uh, a little bit south. Um, and so this is, you know, another one in the long line of, you know, procedural dramas. Um, this isn't necessarily a procedural because I think there is sort of an ongoing thread, but there's, there's sort of cases, I think, throughout. Um, 
I, I guess it's hard to say. I'm only two episodes in, but uh, but there's eight episodes total of this, and um, you know most of the cast is only in a small handful of those episodes. Um, at least according to IMDb, I haven't seen the rest of the episodes, but most of them listed as only three or four episodes. Well, you know, the, the main detectives and stuff are in all eight episodes. So, uh, you know, that, that tells me a little bit that maybe this isn't necessarily a, a through line with the whole season, but maybe a bit of a procedural as well, um, which we don't get a lot of on streamers. I talked about that when we did the the latest Star Trek show, was that called Brave New World, um, where I sort of noted that it's, it was nice to see a, you know, a standalone weekly type of show on a streamer because they expect that you're going to just binge it um, or watch it at your own leisure, whatever. So it's easier to tell, you know, one big long story. But you know what? Sometimes a procedural is okay. There's a reason that CBS is the number one network on TV because they have all those CSIs and NCISs and, and all of that that are, you know, week by week. Um, so this is, this is good. Um, you know, I like the acting here. Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure that it tells us anything new. Um, oh, and I have, okay, I haven't seen this gentleman yet in an episode, but apparently Chris Sullivan from This Is Us is in a couple episodes too. All right, so IMDb has told us that. Um, all right, well, he's not in the first two, so he, see, he might be part of a, a different case or something. Um, we like him though. Um, so yeah, this is, it's good, but it, I don't know that it's necessarily breaking any new ground. You know, the acting is fine. The mystery is fine. Um, but you know, is, is it that different from a hundred other things? No, but if you like this sort of show, I think this will hit that sweet spot for you. Um, because it, it does kind of straddle that line, I guess, between long form and procedural, um, and, maybe some character development along the way as well. I haven't seen too much of that yet. Um, but you know, we, we may get some as it goes on. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's fine. It's, you know, not, uh, anything new. Um, but it's, it's definitely good in this genre, uh, which is very crowded <laughs> as it is. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll leave the calling with a B minus. All right, so let's move over next to uh, Nickelodeon and our two sort of kid shows. We'll, we'll do these pretty quickly. I usually do, uh, but I like to toss them in anyway. Um, I have young nephews that still watch Nickelodeon all the time, um, and, and you may have you know kids in your life as well that are interested in this, or you may like this kind of stuff yourself. Uh, I know I certainly do sometimes too. So uh, we'll talk first about The Really Loud House. This is based obviously on The Loud House, which is, uh, I think, Nickelodeon's second longest running show. Maybe not ever, but certainly currently. Um, you know, SpongeBob, of course, is the longest, but I think Loud House has been on for like five or six years. Um, and uh, this is sort of a, a direct descendant of the uh, television film A Loud House Christmas, which was a live action version of The Loud House. And a lot of the actors, I think, that were in this uh, or th that were in that are in this as well. Um, so I like the Loud House. I think it's funny. My nephew, you know, used to always have Nickelodeon on and they, they would run, if it wasn't SpongeBob, it was Loud House on a Saturday in marathon form. Um, and, you know, it's a funny show. I saw the movie a couple of years ago and that was really cute. Um, and this is like, okay, but I just don't quite understand why. You know, like, I feel like you could do so many more things with an animated show uh, in terms of, you know, crazy, you know, situations and stuff because you're a cartoon. But also, you don't have to worry about the kids getting older. Here we have live actors playing all of the kids, obviously. And there's a lot of them in the house. That's kind of the whole bit. Lincoln Loud is the only boy in a house full of girls. Um, and so, uh, you know this show can only probably run about two years before, you know, they, they need to would either age up the kids or, or whatever. So it just, I don't know. I, I can understand that maybe they wanted to try something a little different. Maybe the animated show's ratings are not as, as hot as they used to be. Okay, let's give it a live action, you know, boost or something. But I, I just don't quite understand the point of this. Um, I mean, it was okay as a show. I didn't mind it necessarily. But the whole time I was like, this episode could easily have been one of the one of the cartoons. Now I will say, because Nickelodeon uh, and Disney Channel usually do the the two fifteen minute you know kind of shorts to make up a half hour episode, whereas this is a full half hour episode. So maybe that is one difference. But they've also had you know extended 
versions or whatever where the whole half hour episode is one you know cartoon so i, I don't know i just uh, there's there's a couple reasons i guess to do it but i see more reasons that this doesn't make sense to me as a show the episode was fine i didn't necessarily dislike it but i, I just i don't get it um you know th this easily could have been just a regular cartoon episode so i leave the really loud house with a c all right, and finally, Monster High. Again, we do these, uh, you know, pretty quickly here, so we'll get through this one as well. But uh, this also follows a, a movie that Nickelodeon did, uh, and this one much more recently, October. They had a Monster High movie, um, and this is based on the uh, the dolls. I, I think this is, I guess, probably the first TV show that that they've done. But I've known about Monster High for a long time. This is one of Mattel's most popular toy lines. Um, and so, all right, let's give it the, the old, uh, you know, series try. Um, and this actually goes back and forth between doing a full half hour and then two shorter 15 minute segments. Um, so, uh, I was only able to watch one episode cause that was what was, what was free on uh, the Nickelodeon app. And that is a full half hour episode called the monstering. It's when, um, this gal wants to sort of, um, put herself into Monster High um, as a human because she identifies with monsters. And I will say uh, it's interesting because it, it does bring up some interesting issues, you know, of current day stuff of like, you know, maybe trans kids and, and stuff like that um, because here she is a human saying, oh, I want to be a monster. I want to be a monster. You know, I, I identify with you guys. Uh, you know, please let me in Monster High kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, I guess spoiler alert for the Monster High show, um, but she finds out she's, you know, half monster anyway at the end, so they let her in. Um, so I'm not sure if the message <laughs> really got through there, but okay, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, there were some actually clever kind of jokes in this, um, some puns about, you know, monster-related stuff and um, that I sort of got, got chuckles at. Um, I, I, I don't think this is anything that my nephews would, would watch, um, and, and I can't imagine I'm going to watch any more episodes of this anyway, but it was cute. It was enjoyable. Um, my biggest problem with it is the animation style, which is uh, pretty common with Nickelodeon uh, and Disney Channel uh, animated shows lately. It's uh, a really kind of crummy-looking 3D. Um, I, I feel like they should just hand draw things because it looks so much better. Um, and, and they just don't usually hand draw things anymore. Um, but because they have, you know, a much smaller budget to work with than, you know, like a Pixar movie or a DreamWorks movie or something, it just, it just doesn't look very good. It looks cruddy to me. Um, so yeah, some, some good jokes. The voice acting's fine, but, uh, the look of it, not so hot. Um, so I would leave Monster High with a C+. I imagine, you know, if you have maybe, uh, little girls or something, they would really like this. Um, you know, for me, I was just lukewarm on it, but I did laugh a few times at the, uh, the bits, some of, some of the, the puns, the monster related puns. So, all right. Anyway, uh, you know, short and sweet when we have kids movies to, or uh, kids shows to wrap it up. But uh, next week, yes, definitely we'll talk about Wednesday and uh, some of the other recent shows that are, uh, picking up some steam. Um, and, uh, we'll do that. I, I think in sooner than a week, because obviously we're, we're sort of <laughs> winding down to the end of the year. I want to sort of catch up on some of these end of the year shows, but thank you for watching. We'll see everybody next time on Damn Reviews It.